Here with me today is one of New Mexico's most insightful political analysts, Richard Fox. He's taught political science for over 30 years at the University of New Mexico and at uh, the uh, Central New Mexico Community College. He's a former DFA analyst uh, in the King and Aya and Carruthers administrations. Richard was Century Magazine's political columnist in the early 1980s. Welcome to the New Mexico Mercury, Richard. It's great to be here. It's wonderful to have you. Nice to see you. It truly is. I think today uh, we're just going to cut to the chase and ask you the basic question. What do you think, in your view, of the, of the Martinez administration in the last two years? Well, I, um, I've, I've given it a lot of thought. And um, I wrote a piece at Christmas time in 2010 during um, during Susanna's uh, transition. And in the piece, either directly or indirectly, I posed, I posed four questions. Uh, first, can, can New Mexico reverse this vicious cycle that we're in of frustrated citizens uh, and elected officials denying state government uh, adequate resources and then turning around and complaining about the lack of or the quality of public services. Great question. Um, second question I ask, maybe even more important than that, is I ask in the column uh, to Susanna, whose income, whose income and standard of living do you and your party plan to reduce to solve the economic and social problems facing us? Now, why is that important? Well, we we live in a in a zero sum political environment, and by zero sum I mean in political outcomes, um, if there's a winner, there must be a loser, yes. and that's the that's the place we're in. It's zero sum. It's winners and losers. Also, I posed, how is the Martinez administration going to distribute the benefits and burdens? of a weak New Mexico economy and a resource-starved government. Yes. The great problem in American politics is how do you narrow the gap between the process of elections, yes. in other words, winning elections, yes. and the substance of actually doing the governing. Right. Campaigning is not governing. Right. So the challenge is, and governing is the name of the game, so the challenge for, for Governor Martinez is to narrow that gap between process and substance. That's a challenge. That's a, cha that's a huge challenge. Um, New Mexico has n enormous social, economic, and environmental pathologies. Um, those are the governing challenges that she faces. Absolutely. Uh, if, I, if I had the chance, if I, if I ever had a chance to sit down with her, have a cup of coffee with her, or a beer. Um, I would ask her. I, I wonder. I've always wondered why is Susanna Martinez a Republican? <laughs> That's a great question. I mean, I, in, in many ways, it makes no sense given her given her personal history. Right. I've observed, I think, as you have, that that, um, uh, that there's some uh, there's a really a lack of New, of a New Mexico focus in her governing style. And I'm wondering if, if she really is merely aping a kind of national conservative platform, um, or indeed if she has a unique vision for New Mexico. Everybody is asking that question. Right. From the New York Times to the Republican National Committee, quite frankly. <laughs> That's great. Um, it's interesting. <clears throat> Susanna Martinez right now is a foot soldier is a kind of a foot soldier in the National Republican Party. Um, look at immigration. Now, immigration is, is currently the consensus issue in Washington. There will be some legislative enactment on, on, on immigration. Also, you have this, in the Republican Party right now, you have this, you have this faux diversity project. <laughs> In which suddenly they're they're reaching out to Hispanics, Asian Americans, 
even Native Americans, others. But we've seen this for the last 13 years. Right. I mean, every four years or so, there is a faux diversity project in, in, in the Republican Party. And they do the same thing. We saw it in 2008. We saw it. Now we're seeing it again. But and and immigration is is the key. Also, um, Susanna is is a, is is sort of uh, a walking, talking, talking point uh, for the failed Republican ideology, which is market fundamentalism, uh -huh. tax cuts, right. and the ongoing corporatization of America. Right. She's a foot soldier. And if you look at immigration, uh, which, which I've done, it's very interesting. You have two Susannas. You have a national Susanna <laughs> when it comes to immigration, where she goes to the Republican Governors Association and she goes around the country talking about how Republicans have to change their tone mm. regarding immigration, soften the tone. Right. And she talks about comprehensive immigration reform. But never, I, I don't know that she ever really talks about, seriously, about pathway to citizenship, right. which is really the essence of comprehensive reform. And then you have the local Susanna. You have the Susanna that won re-election by projecting a subtle anti-immigrant sentiment. And you have a Susanna that's focusing, if not obsessing, on this repeal of the 2003 law allowing illegals to obtain a driver's license. Right, right, right. It's the wrong priority yeah. in terms of immigration locally. Right. And it's been, it's been very divisive. I, I recently learned that, that between 1995 and 2006, illegal immigration from Me just from Mexico, not from Central America, but from Mexico grew uh, by approximately 4.3 million people. But here's something even more stunning. Immigration right now, immigration has gone down, has de illegal, excuse me, illegal immigration has gone down dramatically to the point where in terms of net numbers of legal and illegal immigrants from Mexico, right now it's at or near, this is net, legal and illegal immigration. Right now, net, it's at near zero. It's been at near zero since 2010. Wow. In other words, the back and forth, Mexico, U.S., U.S., Mexico, immigration and emigration is, is almost near zero wow. since 2010. Huh. Since 2011, excuse me, since 2007, uh, net illegal immigration from Mexico has been near zero net illegal huh. has been near zero. So the issue is important, but certainly not as salient as it was um, as recently as two years ago. It's, it's simply, it's, again, it's important, but not merely as salient. So you have the two Susannas. You have the national talking one way, mm -hmm. and then you have the local Susanna, who's rather divisive and rather tough talking and talking the tone that she says that Republicans nationally shouldn't be talking. Right. So it's a very interesting schizophrenia. When you talk about the question, who benefits and who is burdened by a government and by an ideology and by policies and legislation, what actually is that implying? Democracy's biggest task is to do exactly that. It must, in a just and fair way, distribute benefits and burdens. This, we, we, we think of the benefits, we think of self-interest in politics. We think of, of, of government providing benefits. But what we neglect to think about is how are we going to distribute fairly and justly the burdens? Right. <laughs> because they come together and they come in, they come in tandem. Right. And so what I what what I mean by it or what I think about it when I when I think about benefits and burdens is 
is how do we do that? Yeah. How do we do that in a way that, that supports democracy and advances it and actually serves the people and does what government is supposed to do? Um, it's all the, it's complicated by this zero sum game, this right. zero sum environment. Benefits for the winners, who wins? Burdens for the losers, who is burdened? Yeah. And this is an extremely complicated matter. Um, it's not for it's not for for the faint of heart in government. Right, right. It's it's it goes along with making making the tough choices. Now, one of the things I've noticed about about Governor Martinez is. Um, in 2011, when she was wrestling with her first budget, um, New Mexico's first budget, she um, balanced the budget, and she and the legislature, and she made a big deal out of that, like maybe she just, you know, walked across the Red Sea or something, uh, walked on water, and that was such a great thing because New Mexico had a deficit. And... Um, there's nothing special about that because every New Mexico governor, by constitution, by law, has to balance the budget. But the backstory of that is, is that in 2011, when she first taken office, her first legislative session, the backstory of that is, is that all the heavy lifting had been done in 2009 <laughs> and in 2010. And what saved Governor Martinez which she'll never acknowledge, no republic, no rational Republican would, is that what saved the Martinez administration and the budget in 2011 was, of course, the Obama stimulus. Right. <laughs> for infrastructure, for highways in New Mexico, right. for education, and most of all, the Obama stimulus saved Medicaid. Yes. So while budgets are balanced every year by New Mexico governors, regardless of party and the legislature, um, let's not get carried away with the fact that, again, the heavy lifting was done in 09 and, and 10 right. and with the Obama stimulus. So when we talk about benefits and burdens, um, let's look at it in another a slightly different way. We are all burdened by poor roads, by devastated social programs, by children who are not well educated because the system doesn't really concentrate on educating young people. We are all burdened by people who are who are unnecessarily ill, who are who are deprived of work, who have to work 80-hour weeks, who have to struggle and suffer just to make a, you know, a bare-bones living. We're also all burdened, I think, by the curious fact that 181 of our dams out of the 398 dams in New Mexico are in a hazardous condition, according to a report in 2009. Um, now, if your if you're underlying revenue policy is to do away with corporate income tax and basically personal income tax and replace it with a sales tax or a series of sale taxes. What is the implication of that? And can you ever raise enough money without ruining the lives of the poor uh, and our lives too, because gosh knows we're not rich. Uh, can you raise enough money to do all the things that we need to do? The, the idea that, that you can cut taxes, indeed, eliminate something as, as significant as a personal income tax, and still have the revenue necessary to make public investments, public protections, and deliver public services is, frankly, preposterous. <laughs> and, and it is part of a long-range plan, however, in the Republican Party to, particularly in states like Kansas, uh, yeah. and Nebraska, where, where they're attempting to implement what's called the red state model. Mm -hmm. This is, a, this is a, a development in the Republican Party, and it's being fueled by a, a very powerful interest group called the American Legislative Exchange Council, 
or we know it as Alec. And the idea, it, it goes along with this 30-year strategy of attempting to, to deny government resources necessary through low taxes, and indeed the elimination of taxes, and reducing regulation. To the, to the point where um, the Democratic Party, and here's the political side of it, where the Democratic Party is unable to reward or placate or get the continued support of its various constituencies. In other words, the, the, the political strategy is to deny the Democratic Party uh -huh. their ability to reward unions, teachers, um, other constituencies, right. ethnic groups, and, and, and at the same time deny government the resources it needs to um, deliver protections, investments, and services. It's part of a larger strategy. In New Mexico this year, what was the, what was the capstone of this great last-minute compromise the, 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 at the very end? What was, what, what's everybody singing and dancing about? with um, uh, John Arthur Smith's great compromise at the last minute. In the legislature. Yeah. In, the, in, the, in this session of the New Mexico yeah. legislature. Well, it was a, a corporate tax cut. Right, right. And from 7.6% to 5.9%. Now, this in New Mexico is called, it's called two things. It's called tax reform, <laughs> which it is not. Tax cuts, simple tax cuts, are not tax reform. There's a lot of other things that go with that. Right. And secondly, even more um, uh, sort of questionable is tax cuts for corporations in this state are called economic development. Right. <laughs> now, this is the oldest saw. This is the oldest arrow, if you will, in the Republican quiver. Tax cuts for economic development. I remember I made a trip in, in, in the early 1980s and I toured about 10 states for Governor Anaya talking about, uh, trying to find out about how other states did economic development. And one of the last things that a company looks for, uh, or a corporation, uh, medium size or above, the last thing they look for is income tax, corporate income tax rates. Wow. Before that, they want to know, um, obviously, they want to know how sound is your education system. Right. They want to know what is the state's cultural and recreational amenities. Right. Um, you're never going to get a corporate headquarters in Albuquerque of any size um, just because the corporate tax is low here. Right. You're never going to do it. We rationalize it by saying, oh, but we have to compete with Texas. Uh, and we have to compete with, <laughs> with Colorado. Right. And our friend to the west, Arizona. Which we will never do. We will never be competitive with those states. In the, in the way that they're talking about. Simply by cutting the corporate tax. One of the most practical public policy ways practical, very practical and pragmatic and very doable to take advantage of all the things that you just said is the movie making industry. Right, exactly. And when you want to reduce, for political reasons, uh, when you want to reduce the incentives uh, for movie production companies and movie making in the state, that, that is something that, I mean, you, we all know the, the uh, ripple effect yeah. of making movies in New Mexico. And, and, and the employment, the restaurants, all of the services that a movie company needs right. on location. Um, this is one of the most practical ways of doing it in public policy. Sure. Governor Martinez, of course, has resisted if not opposed. We've noticed that uh, over the years, that even when um, conservatives lose elections or can't dominate a state or a particular locality, they engage uh, winningly in many ways in politics by other means. What does that actually entail? About 20 years ago, 
two political scientists wrote a book by the same by the same title mm-hmm. politics by other means by other means and it made a great impression on me then and over the years periodically i sort of trot it out and reread it and and uh, and take a lot of lessons from it well politics by other means essentially comes out in the context in America today of what I think is the diminishing importance of elections and the diminishing importance of the vote. Hmm. Look at Bill Clinton. He wins, he wins in 92. He wins re-election in 96. And the Republicans from the very beginning, right from the start, 92, 93, when he took office, began to delegitimize his presidency, culminating in impeachment. Right. Look at Barack Obama. From the moment he was elected, and this is a complicated brew of race and uh, the unwillingness to accept uh, a moderate liberal Democrat in the White House, but right from the start, they began to do the same thing, delegitimize this president, obstruct, which is part of politics by other means, um, damage Obama in any way possible, including denying his birthright, right? denying his, <laughs> his citizenship, right, right. any way possible to obstruct and damage, and any way to obstruct government. This is what's going on in Congress right now to the point of dysfunction. And then you turn around and blame the party that you're, and the president you're delegitimizing for all the dysfunction that's taken place. Right, right, right. No, that's a, that's a, that's a strategy. It's a whammy. And it's politics, it's politics by other means. As I said a moment ago, you, you deny your opponent the ability to reward constituencies, to placate them, you deny them or undermine their support right. for that's politics by other means. But but more specifically today, if you look at the Republicans, you see the following tactics. One, continued this continued obsession with voter ID, right. which leads to a continued obsession with voter suppression. Right. That is a tactic of politics by other means. Redistricting. The whole, and, and the Republicans have been very good at some of these yes, things. Yes, sure have. The whole redistricting thing, where you, by gerrymandering, you diminish the Democratic vote. In other words, in 2012, the Democrats nationwide got over a million votes more than the Republicans, total votes. But the Republicans maintain their House majority by redistricting and gerrymandering, by concentrating Democrats in certain districts, right. sort of pooling them there. Right. That's politics by, by other means. The use of the Supreme Court and Supreme Court litigation. Right now, there's a, a strong challenge to Section 5 of the, of the Voting Rights Act. Right, 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 right. Um, this basically, right now, if you're going to, about 10 states have to get approval of the Justice Department before they can change their voting laws in respective states. Section 5 calls for that. Republicans are challenging that. They say there's no need for it anymore. And you, can, you obviously know where these states are. They're concentrated in the, in the South. Um, so the challenge, the, the litigation challenge in court, using the Supreme Court, the filibuster, yeah. the use of the House majority for no compromise on revenue, debt, or deficit, no compromises, um, and using essentially you ignore election results, right. you ignore them, um, and you then use this these tactics of politics by other means to diminish the vote, capital T, capital V. Um, that is that is politics by other means. And the Republicans, um, frankly, are doing a relatively effective job right now 
I think we've seen over the last 25 years a diminishing of the the pillar of American democracy, right. which is the vote. Yeah. I mean, I know our students are, you know, always questioning, I mean, is it important to vote? And, um, and I always say, well, of course it's important to vote, but my vote doesn't matter. Well, as we all know, when you reduce politics to only voting, not to lobbying as a citizen, not to understanding the major issues as a citizen, not talking to all of your, you know, your representatives as a citizen, then you've, then you've really diminished the whole democratic process. This has been terribly enlightening for me, and, I'm, and I've just enjoyed this very, very much. And thank you so much for being with us. I wish we had more time, but we'll call you back if we could. It's been my pleasure. And anytime you'd like to have me back, I'd be, I'd be delighted. Well, we would too, and we will. Thanks so much. Thank you.